some things I'd never asked you actually I don't know why but yeah okay. <laughs> uh, but I want to first start like I, I checked on Bandcamp you have this new duo out with Tim Byrne mm -hmm. Blood from a Stone and uh, I, I think you never did a record a duo record with Tim except the first ones which were like the, the bigger bands like the current set and split image but how did yes. this duo come along I mean it happened well you know we we toured as a duo in the 90s seriously I didn't know yeah. that we had a duo and it was called we're still alive 90. really i didn't know that and That's then we cool. had another we did another tour and i think we we're still alive 95 something like that's <laughs> i got a cool one <laughs> it's just uh, as we say our mordant wit you know that word mordant no nee, no nah. m-o-r-d-a-n-t okay mordant wit is kind of like dark humor ah right? okay okay um Anyway, uh, yeah, that, that, that occurred because I've been doing a lot of Zoom duo or, you know, uh, quack trip duos. I've been recording with Jane, Jane Ira Bloom. Ah, oh, like do us. Online, but the way we oh, do it, oh, well. we record, she records at her place and I record at my place into Pro Tools using Zoom as the sort of connection. Oh, okay. So we're not using any of the audio components of Zoom. We just use the video as a sort of monitor and whatever. Uh, unless there's serious latency yeah and then, you know, but anyway what we do is we do the we do the clap test where we yeah, yeah. you know we join and yeah. then I line it up later when she says oh, oh that's cool and it's perfectly in time and there are there are sort of uh, phenomenological aspects of it that I can't explain but we won't go into that <laughs> but we are able to play we're doing mostly open improvising Wow. And it was, it's actually been a, um, it's been a, a godsend in the sense that uh, I remember the first time Jane and I did it with, with Zoom and it was really bad. I mean, in terms of the sound was bad, the latency was bad, but we were so happy to, to play oh, yeah. with somebody, interact, you know. And afterwards, we were just very moved that, that you know, because in the midst, you know, I'd been sitting at home practicing and writing and everything but wondering what the hell is going on and actually applying for unemployment insurance which took oh my God. forever because <laughs> the, they didn't have infrastructure for self-employed people yeah right so anyway we've we we got it together better so now and she's got good microphones and a decent uh um you know a, a digital converter yeah that um so we were able to do we we're, we're compiling a bunch of stuff maybe to release but really nice, nice stuff. And I'm getting good sound and mixing oh, wow. it. And everything. Mm -hmm. and then Tim and his wife came up to visit because my, my girlfriend and I, are, we're in the country. We're living in the country right now. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So you're not the uh, Lower East Side. Nope. Oh, okay. That's good. We came up on April 6th and we've been up here pretty much full time. That's know? better. Yeah. So we have a, like a lot, we have some land and we I built a platform and we put a big tent on it so guests could stay in the tent. Wow, man, that's amazing. So Tim and Sarah came up uh, and they just stayed one night and we had like dinner outside and we were, you know, hanging out and Tim and I, after a couple of bottles of wine, came up and, um, you know, my studio is in a little bedroom and I ba we basically, you know, recorded at night. Oh, wow. And then the next morning after breakfast, we recorded another... 45 minutes or an hour so we had about 75 80 minutes of music wow. you know and so then over the next week i i mixed it and edited you know, I not really edited it was more like just choosing takes and, and mixing yeah. it you know and in the end we decided to put it out so yeah that's that that's the beauty also of uh, i saw it's on Bandcamp, right so uh that's the beauty, I guess, at least this part of the musical industry nowadays, that you, we can do that, right? Well, I, Bandcamp to me is the best, the best format 
for independent musicians yes. to to do any kind of business. You're not going to get rich doing it, but um, yep. the fact is that they only take 15 percent. You know, it's it seems to be ethically done. Yeah, it is. Yeah, compared you know? to the other platforms, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I refused to put my stuff on Amazon because they they were going to make like three times as much as me. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 my portion went to paying the musicians. Yeah. You know, un until it was pay you know they were paid, and it was just it just seemed criminal that they would take more than the entire record company got. Yeah. 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 It's bizarre. Uh, it yeah. was. You know, I just bailed. I wouldn't. And and then Spotify and Apple Music. No one asks me. They just take your shit and put it up there. Yeah. And that and also you got like per stream. I think it's like zero point. Oh, zero, yeah, that, zero, 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 one dollar. It's like I got I got two two checks from Google <laughs> for one cent. Oh my god. That's bizarre. Are you serious? One cent. You should keep them and frame them. <laughs> uh, they're on my wall in New York. Oh well, good. Okay. That's they are. Good. One cent. It should be. I said, yeah, that that basically says it all. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but Bandcamp is like in this sense, it, it, at least it's a good good thing that independent music can get out in this way and you keep basically 85% of the share and you share yeah, it among your yeah. fans. So, yeah. And then they have those Bandcamp Fridays where they don't charge yeah, anything. That's amazing. Yeah. But so did you check out my Bandcamp site? I have tons of stuff up there now. I, I saw it. Uh, you, you know, I, I saw like, you, you know, these records that... You yeah, yeah, all those. You, I, I just put that one up, you know. Yeah, I, I saw that. You gave yeah. me these, these yeah. in New York and I listened to them so much and they were not available anywhere. So I was so happy that I had them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, and now, yeah, so it's like people should definitely check it out and the, since you have the music out there. So that's quite cool. That's right. But I, I, I wanted to ask you, Mark, just about this also. You, you founded Radio Lex like at least 20 years ago, right? Or something right. like that. Right, right. Like, why did you follow that decision? I mean, like, okay, like the pro is definitely the pros and cons, like you have independence as an artist, but you had like, also you work kind of with some bigger labels like Enjo and stuff like that. So what are like the pros and cons for you? Like having your own label throughout this time? Well, one of the things was, I mean, an important thing is getting the music out in a timely fashion, yeah. you know, when you deal with a label, the stuff you, you know, the stuff you're excited about now, it's going to take a while, yeah. you know, like, first of all, if you, if you send them stuff you've done and they say, well, we'll put it out in two years, yeah. there's a sort of disconnect there, yeah. you know, um, and I, I, I guess I like to finish something and then move on. So in that sense, you get to do the timing of your productions you yeah. know, and, yeah. and what you're working on uh, now kind of has a more immediate connection to what you're doing on the road, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll yeah. tell you just one of the funny things about in the old days, I remember like I would be planning a new re recording with Enja, right? Yeah. And they'd give me a sort of release date and it was pretty, usually it wasn't too far away, you know. Um, and then I would plan a tour like two or three months after the release date. And not one time was the record available on the tour. Yeah, that's bizarre. <laughs> not one time. <laughs> Even with leaving like three months extra after that's... the release date, you know. Yeah. So you'd be out there like doing a three week tour, four week tour. Not having the album. No CDs, you know, yeah. back in the, back in the day when you would carry stuff with you and sell it, you know. But were like labels like I don't know, like this, this one current set like Enjo, did they actually like pay? Like nowadays, nowadays labels don't pay anymore. Almost no, like, that was that was for back musicians. Then, back they then actually then paid. Budget. Yeah, yeah, there was oh, a wow. budget for That's the amazing. whole thing. I'd work out a budget, That's you amazing. know, projecting how you know how much I had to pay yeah. the musicians to be to be fair and reasonable. Yeah. Um, I paid as much as I could, you know, it was, it was not, it was never insulting pay, although there were some higher level cats that wanted more bread, but, you know, <laughs> uh, and, you know, so you'd be sometimes limited with that, but, yeah. you know, 
it, it was it was it was good. It was really it was good. actually done like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was done professionally and yeah. And then uh, yeah, so I got some nice documents that way. Yeah, definitely. I, I, can we just return to Tim? Like, uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, he, he's on the first record, the split image, which what, what is nineteen eighty four or eighty three? Eighty four, eighty five. I think we recorded. I think in eighty four. May have come out in eighty five. Yeah. So, but like. What, 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 until what time do you go back with Tim? Like, and how, how did he help you with the first record? Because he's on both first records, right? Well, I think, uh, I forget when we met, but he was working with me at the time. And, you know, we were doing gigs together. And I, no, I, I was waiting for a label to offer me a date, but they never okay. would, you know, because I was a bass player and they didn't consider... They didn't think much about bass player composers, but if yeah. you played a saxophone, they would give you a gig immediately, give you a record date, you know. So, um, not to not to get into any victimhood, it was a, no, no, it was yeah, a kind sure. of reality. But I could I couldn't understand how, uh, especially if you were a composer as well, when you consider like Curtis Counts, uh, you know, Mingus. Yeah. Many, many, many bass players back then, you know, Oscar Pettiford. I mean, yeah, for instance, the serious yeah. composer bass player guys. There's a precedent, in other words. Yeah. You know, and there was still this, you know, man with the golden horn mentality where, you know, if the guy plays the saxophone, he's going to be a band leader. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So anyway, one, uh, Tim said to me, man, like, you know, John Rosenberg is working at this studio for these gangsters who haven't paid him in three months, but he gets free studio time after hours. So we should go in and record. Oh, wow. So it's just that suggestion. And so we went into this place with the quartet and then Dewey came in later in the oh, evening. Wow. We or, you know, we just did it in one night, yeah. one, one session, five or six hours, I forget. Amazing. And recorded the record and it came out really nice. You know? But did you already think about, I mean, like, when was the time, like, that you started thinking about making a, a record as a leader? Like, well, already years, before, or years like... Before. Years yeah. before. I, I've been writing music for, like... Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. Years and years already, you know? Yeah. For 10 I, I, years I've been composing music, so I had a backlog of pieces. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I listened to this, uh, uh, this one tune on bass, drum. I didn't know it's online on that uh, gyra, the tune. Gyro? Gyro, yeah, like it's on Quinza or the first record of bass, drum, and bone, or the second. It's a, I think it might be on the first one. On yeah. the first one. Yeah. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> What's that happening was, there? <laughs> that was in. Uh, I wrote that in like 1975 or 76. Wow, that, that I mean, because it sounds like you know what all these guys, the new wave is doing now. This polyrhythmical stuff. It sounds like this basically, but from 1975. Doing it way before that, man. Amazing. Yeah, I yeah. mean, so what's happening in that there is this, and there's a funny story associated with it. I have to tell you. I, yeah, please. We put we put the record out on Jerry Hemingway's label, Oracle Music. I think that was the first record, and on that tune, Gyro, um, there's there's a section where I'm playing in thirteen eight, and Ray's playing in fourteen eight. It's like a skip beat. It's, 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 it phases for 13 yeah, yeah, cycles okay, yeah. and then joins back. So oh, wow. and it's, it's so long that it sounds like Philip Glass music. Yeah, so, it's incredible. I love that. So it turns out that Jerry Hemingway, with his, you know, he was selling the record as it was vinyl then, right? Yeah. And um, he was getting returns because people thought the record was skipping. <laughs> Seriously? Honest to God. <laughs> Wow, okay. that's, that's so okay. cool. Wow. No, but it's... The record was skipping, there was a fault with the record, so they sent it back. Wow, man, come on. That's quite a good one, actually. No, but that's really progressive, like, you know, from, I mean, what you wrote, like this composition, it's really, really amazing. I love yeah, it. I wrote it when I was like 25, you know, wow. it was pretty young. I was in graduate school, I think, when I wrote that. Yeah, it's not it's just a small detour. I, I just remember it now since yeah, you were yeah. talking that you wrote music. But uh, I just wanted to ask you also about this one since, since we talked about Open Loose before. And uh, 
you have like kind of this two really long musical relationship. One is bass, drum and bone, which I would like to return later to. Mm -hmm. And then the open loose trio, which first of all, kind of blew my mind when I, f I think the second time I came to New York and when we did that record two hours, <laughs> because basically I didn't even th know that, you know, I think one critic that once told me like, man, you hired open loose trio and you know, those guys, guys were, are like that. And basically we did like 11 tunes of mine in two hours. And that, that's kind of the first time it really blew my mind, like, wow, this is how this works. <laughs> because you guys were just like, <laughs> you and Tom kind of, you know, it was not even such easy music. And no, but we just did like one take. <laughs> okay, next. And everything sounded amazing. And I just wanted to ask you, like, how did you guys develop this kind of almost like telepathic relationship? With, especially with Tom, I mean, well, Tony, I, Tony, Tony, but like with Tom as a rhythm section, you're like incredibly tight. I mean, yeah, well, the, the, they all have the skill set to. There's a basic thing that um, that happened sort of through from when I was a younger musician that um, people started to write more structured improvisation pieces that had complex notation mm -hmm. plus either open form improvisation or structured improvisations yep. in, in any form, like either over a sort of pasta calia long bass line uh, or or thematic improvisation, which required the skills of, well, there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on there in terms yep. of interaction, different skills. But one of the main skills is to be able to go from improvisation where you're just out in the zone and then come back directly yep. into a notated piece. Now, of course, it requires that somebody writes the notation in a clear fashion. Well, yeah, I guess this helps. Yeah. Unlike some guitar players that I've met in my in my history. Yeah, I have no idea what we're talking about. But um, <laughs> yeah, I remember so, there was so no that, programs then. <laughs> yeah, in that in that sense, uh, Tom and, and uh, Tony were very very skilled at that sort of thing. Yeah. And. Um, and we all came up doing that, you know, in other words, that's a skill set that became the norm. The yeah. other thing that was happening was in New York, it seemed like people would put together ad hoc groups uh, just for a project yeah. or sometimes just for one gig with all new music. And you weren't going to spend like weeks re rehearsing. Yeah. You would get like one rehearsal maybe. So the, the skill set of people being able to absorb a piece of music from notation and maybe some instructions to full realization and make it mm. feel like music that that became like a a, a kind of a common skill set yeah amongst a number you know highly literate in terms of visual aspect of interpreting notation and all the skills to to take that material inside and work with it in, in basically do something with it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But when did you meet like Tom and, and Tony? I mean, I, I guess Tony you met later, but like when did you meet these Tom, I met sometime, you know, I can't remember exactly in the late 80s and the early 90s. Well, no, it, well, we were working together by 90, I guess. So I, I don't remember exactly, but we met we met on a dumb gig, actually. <laughs> what, what was it? It was just a dumb gig. It was a stupid gig. You know, it was just something for money. Oh, OK, OK. You know. And uh, and we we you know. We, oh no! Wait, wait! Tom told me it was on that boat. It was on a boat. Yeah. I, Tom told me. Yeah. Okay. I know the story now. Okay. You can't hide it, Mark. It's a it's official. Sorry. Oh man, that was absurd. But it was beautiful because it was it, in a way it was perfect for Tom and I to meet under those circumstances because we were both sitting there going like, damn, how do we end up here? You know. But I remembered that the feel was yeah. like amazing even though the music was bullshit you know yeah was, that, that's right? what tom, tom said as well but yeah. what about tony i mean like i guess when you started playing with tony tony was like one of these young cats who came to new york yeah he i don't know how long he'd been in new york i think actually tim recommended him to me tony oh wow okay yeah because ellery ellery was working with open loose yeah. in the very beginning and then he just said look man i'm really concentrating on my own group and I totally understood that it was there was no rancor there. In fact, Ellery's played with us a number of occasions yeah. after that, you know, and we're really good friends. 
Um, but I understood his, his situation. He really wanted to concentrate on that. And I knew that, the, you know, I didn't want to get into that time commitment, yep. you know, conflict stuff. So, and, you know, Tony came in and, and it was great right from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, you can hear this, the new one, uh, at the third proposition that you also put mm -hmm. out this year. I mean, oh, it's like from, a, yeah. from an old, uh, from an older tour, but right, it, it, it right. sees, you know, I remember seeing you guys live in, in, in Graz. Uh, the trio in Stockwerk, mm -hmm. and it's. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, like, do you have guys? Do you guys have like? I mean, a really uh, long list of tunes that that you know, and you can just go into something. Because I, I think, like, when when I heard you guys live, it was just you played something, and like you said, you kind of a dro drove into a tune, and then you went in an improv and into another something. Right, improv. right, yeah. That that was like. Uh, if I had a better memory, I would be able to, I mean, it's hard to remember. I have very long, complex bass parts in these pieces. Yeah, yeah. And, I, the, and it's all counterpoint. So the one voice by itself only tells part of the story. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's, it, yes, I mean, I, I just the memorization thing of that much music. I mean, there were like 90 pieces in the book oh. or something, you know. I mean, I, there are pieces that I went back and listened to recently that I forgot I even wrote because it's been so long and we just did them for, we were in the repertoire for a while and then we moved on to a whole new set new of stuff. One. Yeah, yeah. Now oh, it's amazing, but, you know, and there's also a poem in this one. You wrote this one, this poem? Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful, man. Seriously. I mean, you know, I'm into American poetry. Oh, you are? Yeah. Well, you know, I did a PhD and from translation and MA in American poetry and Oh really? Yeah, yeah. And, and who were the poets that you like in particular? Uh, like my favorite American ones. I mean, I did like I would say Creeley, Robert Creeley. Robert Creeley, yeah. I did my diploma work, my BA in Wallace Stevens. So. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And lo lots of new guys, you know, like Gary Snyder, Frank O'Hara. Yeah, of course. John well, he's Ashbury. not new. Yeah, I mean, yeah. For me, it's one, like one of the original Zen guys, you know. John Ashbury, you know, all these guys. I mean, Ashbury, Gary. I got all, I got a bunch of his books. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that stuff. So I, I was surprised. Ann Walden, did you ever read Ann Walden? Uh, no, like no. Mark Strand. I love Mark Strand, for instance. Okay. Also. And E. Cummings, come on, that's yeah, yeah. Well, all these guys. But anyway, I was so surprised that I saw that. I was like, damn, that's <laughs> good stuff in here, also. <laughs> <laughs> But, but speaking of trios, I just want to go also to the bass drum and bone. I, I yeah. never saw you guys live, but uh, this one is even longer. It's I think you guys celebrate no, now. Seventy seven. We we met. Wow, that's we like playing together. Seventy seven. How did you meet? Like how did you meet Jerry and Ray? I mean, well, I was going to graduate school in New Haven, Connecticut, and I met Jerry there. He's from there. Yeah. And and Ray. Ray is from Chicago, oh, I didn't know. then he lived in California, then came to New York around 75 or something like that. I'd have to ask him, I forget exactly when he got to New York, but he, he had been in New York for a while. I went to New Haven in 74. I met Jerry pretty much immediately and we started working together with Anthony Davis. Oh, wow. Really? And th then I met Ed Blackwell up there because he was teaching at, at Wesleyan University it was only like 20 miles away. But uh, one, Mark Dresser also moved to New Haven. Really? So that was like the scene there, really? Like well, in the 70s, or... people make a thing about it. It was a funny kind of coincidence. Wadada Leo Smith was there, living there. It just... Seriously? Yeah. Wow. Uh, let me see. So there was, I think Ray... Ray and Mark Dresser sort of just knew each, just had met and knew each other. And Dresser moved to New Haven, and um, Ray came up one weekend, and I, we met briefly, I think. And I forget how it happened, but anyway, Hemingway had this concert arranged, and we got together, the three of us rehearsed in the afternoon, learned like five or six pieces. And then played the gig, and that was the start. It felt great right away. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's an incredible event. Special. Yeah, it's it's very interesting that serendipity when you when you meet musicians and you just connect. Yeah, yeah. So so that and that became a thing. Yeah. And 
you know, we've worked intermittently for 40 some years now. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, like, what, 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 but what's the difference? Let's say you have open loose and you have bass, drum and bone. What's changes for you as a composer and as a bass player? Like if you compare, I mean, it's obvious, like for me as a listener or as a musician, I hear the differences in a way, but like yeah. what changes for you personally? As... Well, for one thing in, in Open Loose it was all my compositions yeah. plus open improvisation in in uh, bass drum bone, it was a cooperative and we, we, we all wrote the music, which was very different from one another, yeah. uh, very distinct. And um, and so, well, let me see. I mean, it's the difference between an oligarchy and a democracy, I suppose. <laughs> well, it's a thin line there, actually. Well, <laughs> also, nowadays, no, 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 it's not. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, just like the, but but the 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 input of other other artists is is yeah. really good. You know, it, it sort of keeps everything interesting. You know. Yeah. No, but it's and, also there. I think you write really different in bass, drum, and bone. Like, yeah, we're writing for different people, and yeah, because yeah, there was uh, well, it's a trombone and a bass. I mean, that's a that's a whole different thing, you know. But do you write like like in this Ellingtonian fashion? Like, you do when you compose, like let's say, do you compose for people in the group, or usually just try writing song tunes? I mean, compositions like. This? I mean, I think I think everything, all of the above. Okay. You know, but clearly, like when I'm thinking about the trombone, I'm hearing different things. Yeah, you know? sure. And I know that I know the instrument somewhat technically now because of working with him for so long. Yeah. And uh, and also, you know, just studies and things. And then with the with with open loose. Yeah, I guess you know it, it's not so much conscious, but. Um, but I keep in mind who I'm who I'm writing for. Yeah. Also, from the standpoint of like the 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 technical freedom, uh, being able to write certain ways that other people maybe wouldn't do so well with. Yeah. But like I know that Malaby is very very good. Well, he and Ray are both very very good at putting life into a written melody. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you, Tony's amazing for that. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, you at might least... not expect. Yeah. And when when Malaby would start distorting a melody, it, to me it was always great. Yeah. When he would do that. Yeah. You know? But he he really could make it sing, for yeah, sure. And Ray, Ray's the same way. They, they they both share that sort of vocal yeah sort of quality in their in their uh, interpretation. You know? Yeah. But when you compose, do you compose? I mean, like many of your tunes are have the groove, you know, since you're a bass player. So do you start like on the bass or do you like sometimes compose on just on the program by hand or piano or? Well, I don't compose on the bass very much at all. Oh, OK. Well, OK. I mean, yeah, maybe a couple things would come out that way. But oh, okay. for the most part, in the old days, I used to just compose on paper. Oh, well, OK. You know, I mean, I still pretty much do that now because uh, the computer interface is a little stodgy. So when you're sketching with a pencil, you can really, you can go graphic, you can go notation, you can, yeah. you can, you can go stemless notes, this, you can do, you know, whatever you want to do, it's all in your hand directly from your mind and your right. ear. Yeah. So that's freedom. Yeah, it's also and nicer, then, the feeling, I think. Like, yeah, like, then later yeah. I'll notate the piece and maybe make adjustments and stuff w w while I'm notating in the computer. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, now you have to, I guess, if you write also for larger ensembles, it's easier, I guess, right? Also. Well, I mean, this, yeah. most of that stuff's done on paper, but then sometimes I just work it out of my head. Yeah. And then uh, when I'm in the computer, all the other stuff I've been thinking about, I can just put it in. Yeah, know? yeah. I, mean, I know what it's supposed to be, so it's just a, yeah. You know, but uh, the, just uh, speaking of Ray, I just want to ask you about something. <laughs> Telepathically yours and pantomime. <laughs> you, Mark Elias singing uh, and the Slickophonics. Uh, you know, I, I knew some of this stuff. And then I, I checked on, you know, Montreal Jazz Festival, that tune going, going, gone. Or going, going, gone. Going, gone. <laughs> yeah. And you on electric bass. And it's, man, you're like a incredible on electric bass. I didn't, you know, I never knew that. I just wanted to ask you, 
about the story of Slickophonics. So what, that was like this side kind of. Yeah, it was a. It, it was it was uh, the drummer Jim Payne had a little studio on Forty Sixth Street in Midtown, and he would have these little sort of funk and R and B jam sessions, you know. And, oh, okay. That's parties, whatever. So I would go up there and we would play, and and, and then it, it started to just develop out of that. And then somebody got a gig at a steakhouse in New Jersey. I don't know how it is. <laughs> <laughs> and and we started just fucking around writing songs together and then you know i don't know it just developed it we, it started kind of as a joke in a way you know like no, but it sounded like a really fun band i mean like it was it was like this yeah. re recording is from montreux jazz festival and you can see the crowd just like yeah yeah and ray anderson going crazy and you're like really <laughs> grooving there it's it's amazing it was that. fun it was fun but you know when you're a young musician growing up where I grew up yeah he played in bands to learn stuff and, and, and also I, I worked my way through college playing in terrible bars <laughs> yeah I can imagine yeah. with murderers and rapists and all kinds of people <laughs> gangsters oh my, oh my God. guns you know. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you know I was in my in, I was in the kitchen of one of these joints studying my harmony book you know I was going to college at the time and this guy came in <laughs> Hold a gun to the owner of the club right in front of me, like I wasn't even there. No, seriously. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God. That's the kind of joints I worked in, man. Oh well, but if but okay, I just want to go to this some other animal, like which is like next, completely different, like which is playing solo, bass, like opposite of Slickaphonics and all these groups. I heard also this record you did solo. On Bandcamp, I listened to some of it, and it sounds amazing. And I spoke to Mike Formanek about playing solo, and some uh, some other players. How do you approach playing solo bass? Because I think your approach is, for instance, completely different than Formanek's. Like, how do you approach playing solo? Well, I like to use the bow a lot, for one thing. Yeah. And uh, you know, part of it is like exploring the instrument. And also exploring pieces. Like I write a lot of pieces for that, solo pieces, mm -hmm. you know. And sometimes maybe take a piece that I've done in other situations and do it solo. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it's an extension of the composing and an extension of all the playing in a way. I, I you know, I don't think of things so much discretionary Separate. and broken up. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, like okay. a, it's a kind of a continuum for me yeah. in a way. Um, one of the things I found about solo playing that was interesting was that the big mistake that everybody makes is trying to fill the space. Yeah, shit, yeah, yeah. You know, because yeah. you're so used to being in an ensemble. Yeah. And playing solo, you got to get with the silence. You know. Yeah. That's that's, true, that, that's super important. You know. Yeah, I, I did some solo gigs before the lockdown. I don't know, started. And it was just the first, it was really scary. <laughs> I was like, damn, you know, what can I do or what can't you do? Like in your, your mind, psychologically, this border that you set, what you cannot do, or I guess it's just in here, you know, so. Yeah. It's the limitations are all within your head. Yeah, yeah. So that's simple. That's why I wanted to ask you how you approach like a solo, because it's quite scary in a way, but I guess it shouldn't be because, you know, fear well, is... Well, no, it's naturally, it's, it's, I mean, you're exposed, man. Yeah, 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 that's it, yeah. You're exposed. I mean, you know, I know a lot of guitar players, they immediately start using loops and all this other yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, that's what I did, yeah, the yeah, first gig. And, it and, sucked, man. <laughs> and I, I, I said, I'm not going to use any, any electronics. Yeah. I'm going to make it all happen on the instrument. Yeah. You know? Uh, in other words, in a way, it's like you, you're, you're, if you think about somebody like Charlie Hayden. Yeah, okay. How much he communicated just through sound and, and no choices and feel. Yeah. And everything was profoundly connected. Not somebody, you know, running a bunch of stuff. It was like, right? So in a way, that's, that's I learned a lot from that. Mm -hmm. but, going internal to the sound rather than the external explosion if you yep. will you know? yeah and i mean not that not to limit you know that not that i'm dissing that at all no no it's sure. just that um you know where do you go from there right yeah yeah so starting small is usually a good idea 
Yeah, no, it's good because uh, you mm -hmm. know it's you play so melodic. You leave, like you said, you leave space, and it's all about the melody. Also, when you play solo bass, you know, or you're not afraid to stay on a D for. Like I love yeah, that. Yeah. 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 Let let the music have an effect. I mean, after all, you're doing it for listeners, supposedly. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I just it's not wanted... all about you. <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> yeah. No, I wanted to ask you, Mark, also about some two other things, like. Uh, you're also a producer a lot. You know, you produced Savino, which is one of my favorite records by Malaby. Mm -hmm. And uh, and some many others, like uh, Andy Lester's Hydra, I love that one. And uh, I, I just want to ask you, how do you see wh when you are set in the role of a producer, what is your role there and how do you do it? My, you know, it's interesting, out of all the stuff that I did for producing other people, I did a lot of Ray's records too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I felt like one of the most important things was to keep the technical process away from the musicians. In other words, not have them have to think about that. Mm -hmm. Like, in what sense? Yeah. Not not to keep the. In other words, keep keep the uh, keep them concentrated on doing music. The music, okay. Keep the situation musical for them. The technical thing exists in in the control room and you know things like that so uh just trying to make the performance situation for the musicians optimal you know yeah then of course i would do the mixing afterwards with the engineer or whatever <clears throat> or, or on my own um but the in the experience in the studio was to because i know as a player that when you're in the studio recording you just hate to be interrupted yeah you know like I was on a, a date in the last number of years and the record label insisted on doing it analog. So okay. we were recording to, you know, quarter inch tape that, you know, <laughs> direct yeah. to stereo. And uh, we're doing these long takes. Shit, yeah, that's... And they had this young guy as the tape operator on the machine. And I don't think he knew how to, um, you know, like he had, I think they were doing like 30 ips, 30 inches per second, which is like 15 minutes of reel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you got to know where you are. And two times the tape ran out during oh, fucking man. intense takes. Wow. I was so pissed off, man. <laughs> because, you know, when, I, when I'm recording, my idea is like, I ramp up and it's like that first take is, is going to be the shit. Yeah, usually, yeah. You know, for me, I'm going to, I'm going to try to, I'm trying to do it, like, yep. get that first one really popping and just get it done. You know, that's that's an ideal. But you know, but it's a, if everyone does that, oftentimes you get it. Yeah, definitely. You know, everyone's yeah. really concentrated and, and relaxed at the same time. And to have them like you go 13 minutes and suddenly the guys, oh, we ran out of tape. You know, it's like, wow, are you kidding me? Wow. And I was like, you know, are you running a digital backup so this shit doesn't have to happen? Because, you know, whether it's digital or analog at that point, fuck it, you know. Definitely, yeah. Get the tape, dipshit. Don't, yeah. you know. <laughs> wow. That was deep. But did, did you get involved musically also, like, in these projects? Like, like, yeah. like yeah, let's say, you. Malaby Sabino, did you, like, give advice what to do or? Um, as, as, as little as possible. Okay. You know? It was uh, more like I, I, in that case, I'm trying to remember, um, it was mostly more like this capturing the sounds okay, and getting the, you know, I sort of respect the musicians enough to think that they know what they're doing. Yeah. If they had a question, of course, I would weigh in with an opinion, but generally it was more like, uh, let me see what, what's going on here and see what, how we can capture it, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because like someone like uh, you, you worked with ECM, right? Also with at least Marion Crispell, I know, and some some other guys. And like uh, I've heard that Manfred Eicher, he's like quite also musically involved. That he says what to do and what not to do. So how do you see that as a producer? You think that's a good thing or not? Like well, it depends. You know, in, in in his case, he didn't. I mean, we did that session. He had a couple good suggestions. Okay, oh, that's know. good then. Yeah. Um, one in particular was kind of far out, and uh, he was surprised that I agreed with him. But uh, it was a good, it was a smart move, you know, smart 
Uh, what was it? Oh, it's just a thing about um, the beginning of this one piece where it started open mm -hmm. and it was a little unfocused. And I was thinking to myself, Man, you know, if you just take the bass out for like, and then, and then Maverick says, hey, Mark, what, what do you think about like taking the bass out until you hit that low F? And I said, absolutely. I said, he said, I hope you don't, you know, and I said, no, man, why, why would I be insulted by yeah. you trying to make me sound good? Yeah, you know? that's good. Yeah. It was, it was just serendipity in that sense that uh, I, I thought the same thing, actually. And then he said it. I was like, yeah, OK. Yeah, uh, that's cool. Yeah, uh, it's good. It's, it's not too much interfering. That's what I wanted to ask you, because it's like quite a delicate process when recording, I guess, someone else. Is yeah, I mean, there, well, there were times when I was much more hands on, especially when there was singing involved. You know, yeah, OK. Yeah. You know, then, you, then you have to really be critical of, you know, in as nice a way as you can. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. But I, I've, I've watched a lot of pop producers work, and and uh, you know they're oftentimes like politicians. They're just they're, they're, they'll tell you what you want to hear in order to get the performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so you don't want to upset people when they're trying to perform. It's just not the best way to go. Yeah, definitely. You know, Leland Sklar, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen that interview? Like he, he when he talks about producers that he has on his base this uh, famous Leland Sklar switch. That's amazing. Man. <laughs> that's that's what every musician should should, should have, man. It's like like Funny. click, and he says like you have to do it so that the producer actually sees it that you do the knot. <laughs> it's like you take a little high off that. Okay, yeah, yeah. The dummy switch. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Mark, I just wanted the, the last part, like concentrate uh, on some other things, which is like the last part, uh, like you being as a sideman, and uh, you've mm -hmm. done so much work as a collaborator or as a sideman. And uh, first, I wanted to ask you, like, if you set yourself, I like that collaborator term. That's good. I mean, it's better as a side person or a sideman because no, because it, you... is, cause it is a collaboration. Yeah, because you basically contribute so much to every record you do, right? I mean, already, you know, you play one note and it's like, fuck, yeah, that's a lot that's, on bass. I mean, it, yeah, 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 it's an important part. And, but first, before I go there, I, I wanted to ask you, like, if you see yourself now as a band leader or as a collaborator, sideman, uh, what are the, what do you prefer, basically? I'll, I'll put it first like that. I just prefer activity, man. Oh, okay. You know, I really, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. At this point in my life, if I'm making music, I'm, I'm having a good time. Okay. You know, really, for real. Yeah, okay, that's good. And that to me, uh, all the bullshit aside, you know, you go through periods in your life when your ego's in the way, you're trying to achieve some sort of notoriety or some level, you know, you're yeah. just trying to have a career. I mean, that's, yeah. that's already hard enough. Yeah. Right? And God knows what the kids are going to do now. But um, yeah, yeah. But as I've gotten older, and I know this is like the, this is the classic, the classic old man shit. You know, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm I'm really just happy <laughs> with music, man. Really, I mean, it's like when I think about the community that I'm part of. Yeah. Uh, it's very profound. Yeah. The people that I associate with, um, that I have associated with, um, I started actually trying to remember things. So I started to write a memoir just, oh, wow, just to sort of try to see if I could remember, you know, and and uh, and chronicle my experience. I would love to see that, man. I, I mean, that, that's why I started doing these talks, you know, because I'm so interested. I, I'm a musical geek, you know. I read about that. And now, you know, I talked to Tony or I talked to Tom, who basically said the same thing, Rainy. Yeah. That he just, for him, it's just like, like you said, now making music, that it's already like this. Yeah, amazing. and I think the COVID thing has really, really put yeah. a period on that or an yeah. exclamation point on that. Yeah. Because as soon as we could not play together, I mean, forget the work part. That was a disaster, of course. But I didn't really, yeah. I didn't, I, that wasn't the thing that bothered me the most in a way. Yeah. You know, and so when we came up here, I just started like figuring out a way I could remain active and do creative stuff with other people. Yeah. Remotely. Yeah. And that's been absolute joy, you know. 
I'm working with a violinist doing duos online and recording. Yeah, I've, I've been doing stuff like that as well, like since yeah. April, yeah, with so many guys. Yeah. So this yeah. concept and, and the whole idea of side person, whatever, whatever yeah. I mean, that hierarchy thing was, you know, that was a construct of, of the society of yeah. making music and the business. But um, when you think about I mean, I wrote some I wrote some notes on something recently. Oh, it was actually the notes to the third proposition, perhaps. Okay. I forgot. I, yeah, I but yeah. I was reading. I was I was writing something about, um, or maybe I wrote notes for a bass player. I forget. But um, about Jimmy Garrison and the John Coltrane Quartet. Oh, okay. Sort of the least, the most, the least obvious sound. Yeah. But so important. Yeah. as I said, sort of uh, tongue in cheek, I said, for those of us who hear below 200 hertz, he was the real nexus of the music. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. Come on. It's, it, so, you know, anyway. yeah, but he's the unspoken hero of that quartet to be, you know. I mean, the way, the way his, the way yeah. he places things with all this activity that Elvin's doing is so perfect. Yeah. yeah. It just makes it move along you know yeah so i don't know i don't know what got me thinking about that but it no was but like uh, you know I, I i know musically i guess for you it's doesn't matter but like j just in terms of being a band leader of the organizational aspect and all that how much effort does it take or did it take for you like was that fun at least in a way being a band leader or Well, the hardest part of it was was uh, you know booking it myself was a yeah. drag, yeah. to be honest. That's yeah. always the problem, and yeah. especially in the United States, it was brutal. I mean, in Europe, I could always get an agent to do something. But yeah, in the States, yeah. you had to do it on your own. Yeah, and uh, that's why we had seventy-two million people vote for Trump. You know, <laughs> beep. Okay, now we can we can give. <laughs> you can take that out, yeah, please. No, no. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Detour, no. no, it's just just booking a tour in the states was really yeah, I can, hard. You know, I can imagine. But you know, the interesting thing that when you'd get out there, like you'd get this sense that this is impossible to do this. It's, you know, there's just no money to be made. There's no audience. But, yeah. And then I'd get out there and I noticed that man, there were like a lot of young people coming to these gigs, oh, like wow. really interested in the music. You know. Yeah. Um, and people would just snap up CDs, so you had to bring a lot of CDs. You could, you could and that helped the, the finances and tours. The tours, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. But if we just go to these collaborations, I just first want to ask you, like, I, I spoke with Matt Wilson about Dewey, and uh, I just wanted to ask you about Dewey Redman first. I heard first, first of all, this duo you did from uh, Pillars and Columns, or yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds amazing. I, I, I was surprised to hear that, first of all, as a duo, because, you know, I didn't know you guys played as a duo, but... Well, we only did a couple of gigs like that. Yeah, it's amazing. We did Trio with Blackwell, yeah. we did Dewey's Quartet a lot, yeah. I toured with that band a lot. Yeah, but how, how did you meet Dewey, and how, how was it like to play, I mean, with him? Well, I met Dewey because um, I was working with Anthony Davis, Quartet with Ed Blackwell and Jay Hogarth, the vibraphonist. And Dewey was looking for a bass player. This is 1978. Oh, wow, okay. And we played in New York at a, a loft somewhere. I forgot which place. And Dewey came down. Oh, wow. To, you know, to hear me, because Blackwell recommended me to him. Because Blackwell and I were really tight, you know. Yeah, you, you played together like 20 years almost, right? Well, 17 years 17, from, yeah. from 75 until he passed away in 92. Wow. You know? wow. But, uh, and then Dewey asked me to come, I don't know, I guess he asked me to come to a rehearsal or maybe just he hired me, I forget. But I went to the first rehearsal, I remember, and we, we played it, he called a Charlie Parker tune and I played the head with him. Oh, wow. And it really surprised him, you know. Oh. He said, wow, okay. <laughs> well, Dewey was Dewey was one of the. I mean, he's one of my favorite people ever. Oh, uh, really? A wonderful man. Wonderful, wonderful man. How, how was he? He like like a band leader or? Oh, 
<laughs> he was hilarious, actually. Yeah, he he was very sweet, you know. Um, I know he he was a complicated guy. I loved him. Man. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was very close to him. We we would call each other even after we stopped playing together. We were always talking to each other on the phone. Oh, wow. And he okay. would just say really really nice things, you know. I mean, like that album Str struggle continues. That's you know on some of those tunes, like well, that tune combinations, or uh, I think it's called like that. That's <laughs> what yeah. what you guys play there. It's awesome, you know. So it's, yeah. it must yeah. mu sounds like a really fun band. It must have been a fun band. So. It was a fun band. Sorry, let me see. No, no, no. Yeah, sure. No worries. Hold on. I got to sure. take it. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Hey, Kenny. I'm, I'm doing an interview uh, with a guy in Croatia. <laughs> okay, yeah. But you're you're in the interview. Okay, you, you're in the interview now because it's on, on, Sky, on, on Zoom. So you're in it. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Take care, baby. <laughs> that was Ken Filiano. Oh, okay. Wow, that's funny. He's in the interview now. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll cut him out. So. <laughs> no, I leave him. I leave him. Okay. At least, yeah, that's good. <laughs> no, but I wanted to ask you. Like, it sounded like a really amazing band. Like musically, you were really tight, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, playing with Dewey was great. The main thing for me was just listening to him just spin out ideas. Yeah. Like seamlessly. And you can hear it on that duo record. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's a little live gig we did in Massachusetts. And I, I found it one day and I said, oh, that's amazing, yeah. man, I think that, you know, I didn't put it out for people to hear me. I put it out for people to hear Dewey because yeah. it, it was, it was, it's amazing. His ability to just flow. Yeah, and you had and you had the same thing going on with Blackwater, right? Kind of like as a rhythm section, like did you guys like talk about playing to, ever about music, or it always just happened? Because it's so you know, I listened to those recordings, like early '90 recordings with uh, Carlos Ward and uh, Graham Haynes, and it's mm. you wrote so much music also for that quartet. I yeah. didn't know that. Then I checked, yeah. And, and he was kind of the leader, but like he must have been like really open. Totally. I mean, right? the thing with Blackwell, we, we, you know, we. I, I'll tell you, when you're playing with guys like that and you're younger. Yeah. Um, I was very conscious of not interviewing them. <laughs> but you never asked, like, how was it? I don't know. In... It's uh, it's kind of weird because I, I, I read a re interview with Blackwell after he passed. Uh, which was so revelatory because he was talking about his childhood more and and real detailed stories about music and and you know learning to play and yeah. you know and I never really bothered him with you know a lot of that stuff. I wanted to be his colleague. Yeah. You know, and I maybe I, I missed an opportunity, but I was always afraid of being one of those those bothersome young musicians that just like yeah okay ask yeah. guys for biographical information every day you know and I'd be like enough so yeah okay but we did spend time on the road a lot of time together on a band bus and uh we would do like rudiments together and stuff he showed, oh, really? oh, well. showed me uh, yeah because i played drums when i was a teenager you know and i did some gigs later in like my late teens early 20s I, yeah. I you know played did some gigs on drums but uh oh. so he had these like exercises of like uh, a rhythm in this direction in the right hand and the retrograde in the left hand played oh, at the wow. same time stuff oh. like that very tricky stuff yeah you know? Can you he had a whole body of uh sort of rudiment stuff that he created um and that was the basis of a lot of his improvisation. I've been yeah. listening to tapes of gigs. I found a drum solo he played at this gig in Glasgow that just like blew my mind. Oh, really? Oh, wow. It's not that long. It's phenomenal. Oh, wow. I may put that out. I don't know because it's oh, so, yeah, you're sure. so good. I played it for Chess Smith and I remember on the road. And he said, man, play that again. I want to hear that again because <laughs> it's <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing. Oh, yeah. wow. 
That's incredible. But with Blackwood, you also had guests, like I, I know on that lo those last recordings, like Don Cherry joined Don you guys. On, yeah, yeah. And you well, played in Don's band in the 80s, right? Yeah, well, that, that was actually a cooperative, but Don was sort of the initiator of it. And how was Don like to play with? I mean, like... Oh, amazing. But because, was he the guy, you know, this? there is this recording you did like 94, I think it was with Nana was, oh, not, Nana was earlier. Yeah, but well, like, it, no, we did one in, in 86 live at the Bracknell Festival. Yeah, it's like like really No, weird. not live at Bracknell, I'm sorry, it was live at Middelheim Festival in Belgium, I believe. Maybe, yeah, was, but like it sounds very... No, no, the Bracknell one was on the record, sorry. That's, oh, okay. BBC put that. But it's very world music kind of oriented. Did, did he have an influence on you in this sense, like world music? I hate this term, but... Yeah, me too. You, I, as soon as you said it, I bristled. Yeah, I know. I saw that. Like, you, your, <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. You know, it's like, like oh, he used the wrong... I unfortunately, he <laughs> used term world music. Yeah, no, but you know what I mean. It's like, it is a... Was he an influence? On, yeah, was he an influence also on you, like later, or in a sense? You wrote some, so many tunes. Anybody he played with, I'm sure, yeah. because he was an incredibly musical guy. I mean, yeah. just being around him was was funny and musical. Yeah, yeah. No, it's incredible because you play, you know, you played with Blackpool, Cherry, and Dewey Redmond, which is like among others, of course. But like these three, are, for me, it's really like wow, that's incredible. It's, I recorded yeah. with Charlie too. Oh, wait a second. Yeah. On, Dewey, on the Dewey record. On Dewey's record, yeah, yeah. exactly. How was that? It's fun. Well, he was cool, also, or totally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, amazing. Uh, Mark, one last thing I want to ask you, so that I don't take too much of your time. Like, you started basically on the New York scene, like late '70s, early '80s, and still doing it now. And how, how do you see the development of the music scene from early '80s until, let's say, 2020? Like, has it become better or Worse, I don't know. In, in, or yeah, hard, Man, hard look, question. When when your career spans the the digital age, analog to digital age, yeah, that's a huge, impactful reality. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, the, you're asking sort of for a reductionist answer, but I can't give that. No, you you can but give I me can, what, what, but yeah. I can give you a couple a couple things to think about maybe um uh, well theoretically like you know like well, there's a thing in sociology called cultural lag okay meaning that like for every technological advance there's you know there's this technology that has no it has no opinion it's just technology yeah and so then how human beings interface with that um you know, it'll 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 show its its uh, abuses until you know for a while yep. until we regulate our behavior and understand the problems created by the human behavior interacting with the new technology. Okay. Cell phones, for example. Yeah. People got cell phones. They started yeah, yeah. having intimate conversations in yeah. public loudly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A real drag, right? <laughs> Yeah. A real downside of technology, you know. <laughs> and then we had to like, you know, we're sitting on a train in a quiet car, some asshole is like yelling into his phone. So I remember one day I pulled my shoe out and started yelling into my shoe, walking up and down the aisle. Because oh, I was so tired of listening to this fucking guy. Oh, fuck, that's so cool. <laughs> um, and so in, with digital technology, technically it democratized the recording process. Yeah. So think about this, in, in, in the 70s and 80s, you went through the filter of record companies. Yeah, that's what I mean, musically, especially. First of yeah. all, you got, a, you, you got the choice to record an album if a record company deemed you worthy. Yep. I mean, in the pop world, the A&R people and the label managers decided. Decided to, yeah. Was, you know, so there, so, and, and, and that was like the evil you know, the musicians, are these evil things, they're evil recording companies and A&R people, they don't, they don't understand, you know. Yeah. But, and somehow good music got produced with that system. Yeah. A lot of people got abused by the yeah. system financially and other ways, you know. Jerry Wexler and Atlantic Records had to pay off 
hundreds of millions of dollars to all the artists they fucked for like 40 years. Yeah, sure. uh, mostly R&B artists, black artists, Motown yeah. artists, you know. Anyway, um, so then you have the, the democratization of technology and then anybody can make like, you know, so now a CD is like, you know, you make it in your mother's bedroom with her money. <laughs> That's the emphasis, yeah. You know, so it's become like a calling card. Right? Yeah, it's like a yeah a card you give. Yeah, I remember when I did my first album, Nat Hentoff, the, the famous writer from the Village yep. Voice and, and various uh, you know journalistic efforts. Um, he wrote that when a when a composer performer puts out their first record, it's equivalent to a writer putting out their first novel. Yeah, you know that felt a little a little. Um, grandiose to me at the time but but i understood yeah, his is. point yeah you know, i understood his point because it was it you are you are fixing a yep. body of work in time and presenting it to be looked at and criticized by whoever you know um or enjoyed you know yep. and then when, when it came to the the digital technology wow that that really changed things you, you, you think mu music lost its value in a way because i remember you know for me still nowadays you know when i put on a cd i it's 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 a process you know you take it out you read the poem or whatever it's in it and yeah. nowadays when i talk to the young people they just you know first of all they don't buy the record okay that's another story i will not go in there but let's say from the value aspect it's just like yeah i listen to 20 seconds and I think that's lost, right? In a way. Well, yeah, I've, you know, I don't know if it's completely lost because the fact is, like, when you start doing like what I did on Bandcamp, yeah, you know, the the sales are are, are modest, but they're healthy and they're they are, good. Yeah, and yeah. There's, a, there's a boutique audience out there that, and people want liner notes. People, luckily, you know, yeah. When I grew up, man, you buy a record, you'd wear that thing out. Yeah. And you'd be looking at the pictures and imagining the, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. The whole yeah. thing. You know, exactly um and i think that there is this fractiousness that's occurred where the idea of an album you know we used to you you would like agonize over the the running order of an album to yeah. create the an experience of the entire piece like a novel you know? or, yeah, like, yeah yeah uh and then you you, you and in, and the irony of that is people are like you know they'll like spotify one tune or you know yeah. blah, blah blah you know it's it's yeah that's a reality the the ex yeah. listening experience has changed yeah um but i've also seen young musicians and young people as they mature start to become more discerning and want to know more history and want to connect you know i, I don't want to make it all negative here because the fact is you know when i was coming up i had to work my way back you know i started out with like miles davis gems of jazz with Monk and all these different people on this compilation and, and unit structures by Cecil Taylor. They were my wow, first yeah. two albums. <laughs> Seriously? Wow. That's first good. two jazz albums, right? Amazing. Uh, and then I worked my way back and, you know, in the last few years, I've been listening to an awful lot of early New Orleans music that's oh, wow. just unbelievable, you know. Um, there's just, it's a huge body of work. It oh, takes good. a lifetime to really delve. Yeah. I mean, a critic has a lot more time to delve historically and listening wise. We have to spend a lot of time working on our own stuff. Creating, actually. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the idea that we would we'd be less knowledgeable about that stuff, of course, you know, yeah. of course, Definitely. Yeah. you know, but uh, in terms of the whole. Yeah, things change and. Um, there's good and there's bad. You know yeah but like you said you know you're doing this like now with jane ira bloom like this you, you know if, if you're like someone like you i think you always find a way to uh, people do to do it and adapt it. yeah yeah so that's in the good. most repressive regimes in the world people still made art yeah they might get killed for it but they still made it yeah you know? that's true that's true yeah. and and you know when you think about I remember in the early 60s, like when the Beatles came, that was the end of music, yeah. right? For some yeah. people. Yeah. Sure. And it turns out that they were actually the extension of the whole Tin Pan Alley songwriting expertise and genius. Yep. You know? Yeah. 
guys from Liverpool. Who would have yeah. thought it? I, Amazing. It yeah. Made a lasting That's impact better. on music. Period. Just everything. Yeah, yeah definitely. You know? Definitely. Uh, and, and people, the way they filtered it at the time was like, what is this bullshit? You know? Yeah. Hawker Jazz.